Good afternoon and welcome to the Healthy Indoors Show. I'm your host, Bob Krell. I'm founder and publisher of Healthy Indoors Magazine, and I'm happy to have you join us today for another exciting topic. Uh, We're going to be discussing the uh, aspects of Legionella in the indoor environment uh, post-COVID shutdowns or restarts. We've had a lot of buildings in this country that have been either fully or partially closed on uh, partial service. And uh, we're going to have a discussion today about how that might uh, affect the possibility or increase the risk of Legionella outbreaks in those facilities. So joining us today is uh, one of our regular featured guests. uh, Happy to have him back in, Dr. David Krause. He's the founder and principal toxicologist for healthcare consulting and contracting, HC3, in Tallahassee, Florida. He's a certified industrial hygienist and a licensed mold assessor and co-authored the 2009 guidelines for the surveillance investigation investigation and control of Legionnaire's disease in Florida, and the 2015 AIHA guideline for the recognition, evaluation, and control of Legionella in building water systems. Over the past 25 years, Dr. Krause has practiced environmental science and public health, focusing in the areas of toxicology, occupational health, industrial hygiene, indoor air quality, and exposure to microbes and chemicals in homes, schools, office buildings, and healthcare facilities. Yeah, that's really, uh, that's a mouthful. So welcome, David. Good to have you back. Um, Thank you, Happy Bob. to have you here. And again, in the co-pilot seat, he's back after a, a week in, uh, in the woods somewhere, is the ever-present provocateur, a uh, healthy building scientist from Hayward Score, coming to us live from Colorado, and I forget which city, Joe Loveland. Merash. Loveland. Great, thanks. Loveland. So, uh, David, you know, uh, you're our Neil deGrasse Tyson. You, you are. He's on whatever show. He's the most frequent guest that always shows up. So you're our Neil deGrasse Tyson. He knows a lot. Interesting. So we welcome you back again and again this year. So wait. Plus, nobody else will come on our show. No, just... Yeah, well, you know, I'll take it. And uh, <laughs> I've been called worse. <laughs> yeah, right. There you go. No, it's it's great. And, and, and just as a side note, uh, about a week was week and a half ago, David and I, uh, David actually uh, did a, uh, a webinar on this very topic for Paul Medical. Uh, and I was uh, there as the, uh, I guess the host for that one and some interesting stuff. Yeah, so you were a pretty good uh, provocateur on that one. Yeah, well, you know, I can play that part. Uh, but you, you've, ra- you know, let's get right into it. You know, you, you've raised this, you raised this specter back early on in our live broadcast back in March and April. Uh, talking about what was going to happen if buildings closed and they restarted, you know, w- w- the Legionella thing, you know, and, and, and he- here we are, lo and behold, you know, it's happening. <laughs> well, and and it's uh, I think we're still just uh, getting a, a peek into the problems that are going to be coming about uh, when we reoccupy buildings. This is uh, frankly what what we often are asked to do in our uh, profession is to state the obvious. Uh, if you take a building and close it down for a while and let whatever bacteria are in there flourish, you're going to have an issue. Um, I, I think we're going to be seeing uh, quite a bit of this as we move into letter summer and fall, especially as we start moving into uh, school. I'll say the attempts to reopen schools. So, so why is this why is this a bigger concern now? Um than it would typically be in, you know, under normal conditions, you know, what, why, why is it such a, why is the situation more severe or potentially more severe? Well, if you think about it, the, the really the only entity adding disinfectant into our potable water is the municipal water supplier. Uh, that disinfectant keeps the microbes that are inherently in the water from growing and amplifying and becoming a health threat. Um, if you don't use that water, in the water lines, in the water mains, in the buildings, and as it sits, the, the disinfectant dissipates. It reacts with the wall surfaces, the corrosion, the scale, the sediment, the other bacteria in the water. And then that water can, after a few weeks, uh, essentially has no disinfectant, no uh, inhibitors to keep the bacteria from growing. Um, that water, you, that usually happens just in a building or two, say at a school, a campus, or, you know, in, in an abandoned high rise. But here we've done it on a broad scale. We've created this experimental design across America in which we've shut down entire downtown districts, 
um, hotels, resorts, uh, universities that have never had this level of inactivity and lack of water usage for such a long period and at the worst possible time. Legionella is a seasonal bug. There's always a little bit of it happening and Legionnaire's disease happening in the wintertime, but the summer and the fall is it's time to bloom. And that's exactly when we've uh, had this issue. So a lot of uh, factors are coming together at the same time. And as soon as you add in the last bit of that recipe, it's just gonna be the people, the receptors, people to catch the bug. Uh, I, I predict we're gonna probably see significant outbreaks occurring across the country, especially in areas that have really never seen this issue before. And this is, this is occurring not classically uh, from the building uh, water cooling towers necessarily, right? Or, or, or well, it'll that... happen there as well. Well, but um, we'll probably see a lot of it from the hot water systems uh, that are in the pot in the buildings, and you can catch this from simply washing your hands with water that's contaminated because it doesn't come from the it doesn't you know come through your skin, but the aerosols created when the water is splashing in the sink uh, is what you end, end up uh, breathing in. Great, we're washing shower. our hands more now too. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Well, that's right. Wash your hands more. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, the shower is the worst. You go to a hotel and take a shower. Um, that could be a major disaster for a lot of people right now. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I've had to travel quite a bit, or more than I'd like to, during this this uh, shutdown period. And I, I will say that there's a lot of empty promises, a lot of hype, a lot of um, signs saying we're cleaning and disinfecting your hotel, we're cleaning and disinfecting this system, we're taking these steps to protect your measure your your health, and uh, frankly, they're not. Um, every single hotel I've stayed in, half a dozen hotels in the matter of a month, had major problems with their water systems, the cleanliness in the rooms, pests in the rooms, ants, roaches, uh, leftover sheets, and finding you gotta other people's hotels in your stay rooms, at, buddy, and, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like I, I, I kind of stick with the chains, you know, it, it, usually if it just has a screen door on the front, you know, and uh, like a, a yellow neon light, I, I no, I usually don't go there. You're just yeah, you're describing, yeah, you're describing I, I wish this I could happening say that too. In, you're describing this happening, though, in, in what you would consider to be probably decent hotels, I suspect. Yeah, these, these are definitely chain hotels. These are, uh, are, are, are marquee hotels, um, and they're, they're simply not even uh, achieving the basic level of cleanliness and maintenance that they had before because they've let off so much staff. Uh, often, I'm be the only person with maybe five or six rooms occupied within the entire hotel. Economically, you can't run a hotel that way. So obviously some corners are being uh, cut. So it's going to be interesting to see how it all turns out. Now, one of the things you mentioned, you know, what, what is the source of the Legionella that's getting into these water systems? You know, I mean, I, I think a lot of us labor under the pretense that our municipal water, you know, the potable water that comes to the building is uh, somewhat, somewhat hygienic. If that's not the case? Well, they, they call it the safe... They call it the Safe Drinking Water Act, but unfortunately, that act does not ensure the water is safe. Uh, there is no requirement that they manage um, the water for Legionella, no requirement that they even test the water for Legionella. But we know even, even as far back as the early 90s, EPA had recognized in their uh, criteria document on Legionnaire's disease and uh, that the municipal water supply was the main source of inoculum for Legionella in cooling towers and potable water systems, because they both get their water from the same source, the, the city water main. So that becomes the seed that then inoculates the prime conditions where the, in the cooling tower or the hot water systems, sometimes even the cold water systems, but I'm seeing it worse now. Even in facilities where we would pick up Legionella 10, 20, maybe 30% of the time we test the incoming water, um, there was a, a one place in Baltimore we recently have done repeated testing for over probably a couple of years now. Um, and the, all three water mains were, de, were positive for Legionella wow. in an apartment complex. So this is not, they're still at 96, 97% occupancy. 
normally you see that issue when a facility has sat stagnant for years mm -hmm. and then you start seeing Legionella build up in the incoming water. So uh, you know, Baltimore is going to have an interesting summer and fall. So you're, wait, wait. Joe, yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, so I want to talk, I'm going to put up a chart and uh, you can, we can talk about it briefly because there's this fine line between well, what happens with temperatures that you can, you know, uh, eliminate Legionella, but you have a scalding effect that is high versus if you want to reduce the scalding effect, then you start to this gray area as to, you know, uh, this is a good temperature to have because you have less scalding, you've reduced Legionella, then at a certain point where it's no longer as hot, now you have high levels of, of Legionella actually reproducing. So I was wondering if you could kind of comment on these numbers or in general, what would a, uh, a business owner or somebody or even a homeowner want to try to find out as to what is their um, temperature or their water to try to reduce this or kind of com combat that challenge of scalding versus Legionella. Joe, Joe, put that back up there. Let me, let me uh, sure. Uh, let me, let me look at that again, because what you're showing here is exactly right. We have, in order to address one risk scalding, we've created another. And, you know, the, the codes that require under the, uh, the national plumbing code and the codes and requirements under healthcare facilities for hospitals, nursing homes, long-term care facilities, all require that the water being delivered be no greater than 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Some, some local or, uh, municipalities actually require it to be 110 or less. Now, you know, that, that sounds great and it reduces a, it reduces a, um, an acute hazard of scalding, which frankly, I don't see being that much of an issue, but, um, you know, it is a potential. Well, we've created a condition where it's almost guaranteed that you're, you've created the conditions that um, Legionella will grow and, prop and propagate. Also, what happens in water heaters is you lose the chlorine. The heat dissipates and, and uh, causes the chlorine to break down much faster. So you have nothing, uh, no control measures, no protective barriers uh, in a water heater that's been set to meet the code. So code here is not only not protective, it actually increases your risk. I think that there's, so if you, your, so your uh, recommendation is to try to keep that between the, around 120 to 130, that's, that's the, that was the green line there as to like, this is a safe manner, low risk of scalding and low risk of um, reproduction of Legionella. Well, it's, it's not protective at all. Uh, the higher okay. you can keep it, the better off you are. Uh, because what happens is you're taking a measurement, or not even a measurement, you're, you're relying upon a gauge that is probably wrong to begin with. It's not highly accurate. And it is measuring at one point in the system. Within it, in most water heaters, they quickly stratify. And so you'll have hotter areas at the top, colder areas at the bottom, the sediment builds up. And so you create a condition in the bottom third of the tank that has sediment, scale, and then you, the biofilm forms and it actually acts as a blanket or an insulator to keep even periodic high temperatures uh, from killing the, the, the organism. So it's, higher the better. And then what happens is you often get the growth in the supply lines where if it's just a dead end run, like in most homes, you don't have it circulating. You have plenty of volume of water, plenty of surface area for biofilms to grow and Legionella to grow. Um, so that can certainly happen. And then if it's a circulating system, you get heat loss. So uh, the water in the water heater may be at 140, but the water in the, um, in the, uh, the research. circulating lines, they may be 110, 105. Uh, so there's plenty of conditions where water heaters are not, are, are, are not going to be protective at that point. Let me just ask a follow up on the water heater. So most people have a tank that is their hot water supply. Now there's a lot of uh, inline or instant hot water systems that are out there. Um, is there a benefit to having something that's not storing my water or letting it um, cool and reheat versus just uh, I get I get a specific temperature out of it immediately to the house. Uh, it does tend to lower the risk, but it doesn't get rid of it all the way. Um, we've cer I've certainly uh, investigated residences and commercial buildings that use instant, uh, you know, on-demand water heaters, and uh, because especially in a large portion of the country, it's not just the South, 
but uh, anywhere throughout the large, uh, large area of the country, you may have water lines running through attics, water lines running outside. Your incoming water may be 80, 90 plus degrees. Uh, so we often find Legionella growing uh, not in the hot water tanks. Uh, so I, I actually have seen it where it, it grows in the water lines. If you can think about the surface to volume ratio, the, the water lines are going to have actually a, a larger surface area. And Legionella eh, kind of grows in the water, but it really grows in the biofilm. You know, you could say you could, you know, it's like with mold. You, you can detect it in the air, but you're detecting the propagation. The home is on that surface. The home is in the, the liner of the duct. Uh, and, if, and, and, and for you guys who've done mold remediation, you've seen a, a fully in, involved uh, duct with uh, mold growing all, all over the interior surfaces. What you're looking is at is a different scale of biofilm in a pipe. And the only difference is different organism and different fluid. So instead of water, you have air. Instead of bacteria and, and uh, the biofilm matrix that they have, of fungi, but it's the same dynamic. Mm -hmm. You'd mentioned that, that you know you in some of the testing you did in Baltimore, you're seeing it uh, a pretty high prevalence in the cold water side. Um, and yes. again, is that because of, of the just the inherent warmer temperature of that water coming, you know, supply water coming in? Because it, it usually the cold water side is usually a little bit too cool, right? For, for really active usually growth. but you can you can overcome that with that with adequate nutrient and inadequate disinfectant um, in this place we were getting practically no, no disinfectant coming into the facility from the municipal water supply for the whole time and the amount of debris scale sediment nutrient in that water was extremely high so it, is this something that is uh, being exacerbated by um, the shutdown, you know, a lot of buildings haven't been in shutdown over COVID. Are we going to see more on the cold side? Do you think? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would not uh, expect any other way. The, there's a, a phenomenon they call water age. So how, how old is that water? And if, if the time starts at the point where it leaves the facility, leaves the treatment facility, and they've injected it with, you know, an adequate level of uh, chlorine, how long before that water comes out of a spigot somewhere and is used? Now, years ago, that may be a matter of a day or two. Then it turned into weeks. In some areas, it's turned into months. And if you can think about the water age of water mains serving a downtown business area that's been effectively closed for four or five months, that's some pretty old water. Can we, so let me ask, so um, uh, let's just say I'm a homeowner that has a, a home that I haven't been in or I'm a restaurant owner, or even if I go to a hotel room. So one of which I have the control over because I own the property. The other one is I'm actually walking into an environment I don't know. So let's, let's go through the scenario briefly of like, I own a restaurant. I had to close it down for the last three weeks, plenty of time for something to develop. What is it that I could do safely to uh, reduce my risk of Legionella for my employees or anybody who come into that environment. Yeah, that's really tough because you, 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 own, you may own the facility. You don't own the water. You don't own the source of the water. And you don't even have the legal authority to treat that water. In order to add disinfectant, in order to sometimes even some municipalities require you to get a permit and a license to filter your incoming water. Wow, that's, you don't that's, have the authority that to do that because you—it's counterintuitive. <laughs> yeah. Hey, they're, but, but they're can, can I not? Sure it's, can I not flush my system to? Um, sure, but what are you flushing it with? Just trying to get dirty, you know, moving, yeah, water moving, dirty, through. un, dirty, unchlorinated, bacteria-filled water from your water main. You know, you see them go out and flush. The, the the fire hydrants once every week, once every month or quarter. Well, you know what they're doing. Typically, they're flushing the water mains in order to get their system ready for the tests that they take. So municipal water supplies have to take samples and, and analyze those samples to comply with the Safe Drinking Water Act. Typically, either it's because of a complaint or uh, the results of bad tests, but often they will uh, go and prep the area where they're going to collect their samples from 
uh, and flush the line sometimes for 24 hours to make sure they have good, fresh treated water before they actually collect the sample that they collect at their time and place of choosing. And then they take it back to their lab and they analyze it themselves. And then they report that to the regulators at the EPA or the state privacy agency. But they don't test so, for Legionella. Um, I don't want to say it's rigged. They don't test for Legionella. They're doing all this just to make sure they have adequate levels of chlorine, which is a very minimal level to begin with, uh, and uh, to reduce the risk of ha having uh, failed total trihalomethanes, which are disinfected byproducts, or uh, total coliform, other you know, heterotrophic uh, bacteria. So they're, they're doing this for other organisms, which they would fail on a regular basis if they did that. Now, they're not flushing for your building. They're not taking samples at a place where people are actually being exposed to the water. They're doing it on the water mains. And so we, we've run into this certainly in Baltimore as well, where they'll look you square in the eye and say, we, um, we don't test here. We don't test it where people use the water. We test at our testing locations. And they've actually admitted in writing that they have actually changed their testing protocols to ensure they pass the test. I don't know what else you call it. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, troubling is what I call it. Um, wait, wait, I didn't even know we still had regulations about water. I thought all of this stuff had been you know, eliminated by the Trump uh, administration that they keep making stuff like uh, that, that was in place, which was a minimum requirement, even less. So I, I was surprised that there still is some type of regulation. And I don't mean that sarcastically, that it's just a sad state of where we're at in terms of what industries can do um, without- Well, nobody's done away with the Safe Drinking Water Act, but the Safe Drinking Water Act wasn't keeping anybody safe to begin with. Yeah, I mean, it seems that way because I think we were all labored, you know, as lay people, laid, labored under the pretense that at least there was some standard, at, at least from the microbiological, like I, under, I understand that they don't test for latent, you know, pharmaceuticals in the water and things like that. You know, that's why I haven't drank municipal water in Syracuse literally in 30 years um mm -hmm. you know not not and I, I'm laboring under I'm also laboring under the pretense that my five gallon bottles of spring water are actually somewhat wholesome and I haven't really checked those either but I mean the reality <laughs> is you know I always thought oh well, kids pharmaceuticals you know you you know you get chloramines you got things like that going on but I always assumed that at least the biological side they were they were dealing with that across the form you know across the whole uh uh scope it used to be true, but we used to treat the tar out of our, our drinking water with chlorine. I mean, you know, you, you'd sometimes even smell it. Uh, it's, it's easily 10 times less than levels of chlorine now than it used to be when I was a kid. Really? Ten, yeah, it's, it's, the reduction has uh, been that substantial? Well, in order to smell chlorine, you're going to be in the, you know, three to four to sometimes, uh, you know, four and a half parts per million and you would be smelling it. That's what you're going to smell at a pool. Okay. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, if you see 0.5 part per million in incoming water, that's great. That's, that's high. That that's, but it's still inadequate to cause, uh, uh, to control Legionella. Well, wait, let's just go there while we're there. So, so what about the impacts of chlorine on the, I, I know you're trying, you're trying to kill one issue and then, but aren't you actually causing a potential second one? You have high chlorine in the water. Is that, is that that's usually something you want to try and filter back out? Um, is something that is impacting the body itself? Well, uh, chlorine. The main reason that they're regulating it is to prevent the exposure to carcinogenic disinfectant byproducts. So again, like with the scalding hazard, which is trying to handle an acute at risk. Uh, they're trying to deal with a risk, a population risk that maybe five, fifteen thousand, between five and fifteen thousand people a year uh, develop cancers that can be associated with or deemed associated with the uh, disinfectant byproducts. Uh, it's it's such a small number that we can't even count it reliably. Probably smaller so, than the number yeah. that fluoridation causes, but that's uh, a separate topic. <laughs> that's a that's a whole <laughs> other topic. That's all. Rock one conspiracies. No conspiracies today. I did not see the conspiracy. I mean, <laughs> why would today be any yeah. different, Joe? Why would today be any different? <laughs> all right. So I want to shift briefly um, to how do I how do I know if I've been exposed to a Legionella? Because it's to me, it's been described as a 
flu, flu like symptoms or something similar. So many people I've heard they go to, they travel and they come back from a, a trip and they're like, oh yeah, I feel like I got the flu when they could have been exposed to Legionella at the hotel. So can you describe some of the mild versus extreme conditions that somebody might experience if they have this? Sure. Uh, well, actually, Legionella, we know, causes at least two different forms of Legionellosis. One is called Legionnaire's disease, and that's a, that's a pretty serious pneumonia. Um, if you contract it, uh, it you're, you're going to need treatment. Um, back when it was first recognized, back in 76, 77, uh, fatality rate was around 30 to 40 percent. Um, it does tend to hit uh, older people and people with compromised immune systems, former smokers, current smokers, you know, the, the typical um, susceptible populations. Uh, now, with, uh, I'll say, a better understanding of the antibiotics, fatality rate's about 10%. If you think about COVID-19, which they think is maybe between 0.1 and 0.5% fatality rate, uh, Legionnaire's disease is much more deadly. Um, the other, uh, and it's pneumonia, fever, pneumonia, um, uh, myalgia, uh, total sepsis, uh, kidney damage, uh, and, and, and death. So if treatment isn't successful, which for some people it's simply not successful, even with, with antibiotics, um, if you catch it in the community, your odds, when, when you're not in a healthcare setting, your odds of uh, dying are one in 10. If you catch it while you're in a hospital, it's about one in four. So not, not, not great odds on that situation. The other disease is um, Pontiac fever, which seems to be more like a, a humidifier fever. It's not an infection, but it does cause flu-like symptoms. And, uh, you know, People always resolve in you know two to three to four days. Uh, no no treatment is necessary. No treatment is useful, and the organism doesn't actually colonize the person. It seems to be more like a hypersensitivity reaction uh, to probably the endotoxins that the organism generates. But both of them could easily, and frankly, are probably being confused or misdiagnosed as COVID nineteen. That was going to be the point I was going um, to both ask. of them. You can't just look at somebody and, and tell the difference. You have to take a test for the urine, for the uh, Legionella. You'd take most likely a urine antigen test where they measure a specific antigen in your uh, uh, urine. Uh, and then COVID-19, of course, has to, has to do a PCR analysis or sometimes a uh, antibody test. So um, that's one of the things we are concerned with. And there have been some reported cases of both uh, people being misdiagnosed and also with people having both diseases at the same time. Absolutely no reason why you wouldn't, if you're susceptible to respiratory pathogens, that Legionella, it'll come through just as well and, uh, in, as, as the COVID-19 and the body is tough getting rid of it. There's um, you know, one reported case recently where a uh, lady, you know, tested positive for COVID-19 and they treated her as such and she's just kept getting worse and worse. Um, turns out that when, when insistent and they, they did do a urine antigen, they were at least able to treat her with the antibiotics that are effective against Legionnaires. So we want to make sure that we don't stop looking when we find something. We want to do a complete rule out because we, we expect to see this. I mean, that raises an interesting question of, you know, first off, um, how how many cases have have been missed, you know, of, of people that maybe were uh, symptomatic, with, you know, the, presented as, as one disease, tested for that, confirmed, and then, like you said, then then no further investigative testing was done to, to find out if perhaps they were suffering from both. And, and the secondary question to that is, since the treatment for each may be con uh, contraindicated for the other one, right? I mean, well, I you mean, for viruses, you treat, you're just trying to provide supportive treatment, right? You're, you're, so you're, you're treating a bacterial infection versus a viral infection. So you treat them differently. So, so you mm -hmm. almost wonder, you know, maybe some of the, some of the mortality in the COVID, you know, could those people possibly have had Legionnaire's disease concurrently? I, I'm just, I'm, I'm raising, you know, I'm raising that question. Well, we, we've recognized this and actually I think on a national academies 
uh, webinar I did uh, a while ago, that was one of the concerns that we brought forward was the, the potential for, uh, you know, just exactly this issue, uh, misdiagnosis. It's scary. Well, you know, it, it, this is a foreseeable ongoing outbreak. Already, we underdiagnose Legionnaire's disease. Already, we've been doing that for decades. Why is uh, that? The diagnosis for it, it's, an, it's a pneumonia, and, you have, and the physician has to specifically suspect Legionnaire's disease and specifically do a test. And prior to 1997, you had to take a culture, you know, a sputum or, or lung lavage and plate it out, and it doesn't plate very easily. We didn't even know that or, this organism really existed as a pathogen until 70s. I mean, it'd been missed. It doesn't grow on the normal stuff in the, in the laboratory. But um, National Academies of Science in uh, 20, August 14, 2015, not 2015, 2019, um, released their report on Legionnaire's disease, in which they estimated that the undercounting, in, in 2018, we had almost uh, 10,000 cases of reported Legionnaire's disease in this country. It's been a nationally notifiable disease since 1977. Um, and it had gone from roughly 800 to 1,000 cases prior to 2002, and it just took off in 2003. Uh, 2003, we had a 70% increase across the country. Uh, and that started raising some questions, but you know, we let it become 650% increase before we actually started really thinking about it. Um, and, you know, it just, it, we hit almost 10,000 cases, 9,933 cases in 2018. National Academies Committee, uh, the actual number of cases, I think, is between 52 and 70,000 cases per year. That's a pretty big underestimate. That was going to be my with, question, because it seems testing. like it is undercounted. Yeah. Yeah. It's been undercounted for a while. Now, we may have actually seen a reduction in cases during the COVID outbreaks um, because people hotels in hot, in doing it and going to the hot tubs. They're not going to the, the spas or the gyms and taking showers in the gyms. They're not um, traveling in hotels. They're not getting on cruise ships. They're not doing a lot of the things where they often catch the disease. But... The organism's still there. And when we begin doing that in earnest again, uh, there may be a, a large number of places that are seeded, primed, and just sitting there like a landmine. Well, you indicated there have been a lot of increases in cases. Um, mm -hmm. in, is it just that have there really been increases in cases, or has it been that there's just been more tracking? Or is it a combination um, of both? So, you know, what you're talking about is called a detection bias. Are we just better at seeing it? Um, that argument has been made, and they, there was a CDC um, paper that was done in 2005, I think, looking at that, in, um, at that sudden increase uh, in, in uh, Legionnaire's disease, mainly experienced along the eastern seaboard, mid-Atlantic states. And it was published in 2006, sorry. Uh, CDC, Laura Hicks, uh, and mostly folks from the CDC and other health departments. And they concluded that, uh, that the, the massive increase along the Eastern seaboard uh, between 2002 and 2003, they attributed it to increased rainfall was associated with the increased disease. Now, that paper, frankly, needs to be retracted because we have not had increasing rainfalls every year since 2003. Yeah. Um, so I think they missed something. But as part of that analysis, they did examine um, detection bias, testing bias. Was if they contacted the companies that uh, sell the urine antigen test, which is about 94, 95 percent of the tests that are done, um, and they hadn't been selling more tests. Um, they, they checked with hospitals to see if they were ordering more tests. And no, they were just seeing it more frequently. They checked um, with the, the state health departments and the county health departments where it was being reported to higher frequency. And they had not 
uh, received more funding. They had not uh, increased their surveillance efforts. They had not increased the number of people who were doing this testing. Um, so we believe it is a true increase and you don't see a, an increase by 650% uh, by accident or by a small confounder. Um, and, and from my experience in the health, de health departments, what we've been seeing is a diminution of the number of people doing the surveillance, a diminution in the budgets for the programs that count, monitor, and investigate these outbreaks, a diminution in the training, a diminution in the pay, a diminution in the experience and expertise of the individuals doing the testing. So where you may have had one or two people the entire job throughout the state was to track down Legionnaires disease cases. Um, with budget cuts that became one person, and then with further budget cuts that became one person that had to do 10 different reportable diseases. So the, the fact is you don't get better and you don't detect more when you have more people and fewer resources tracking it down. So I, I, I don't see any evidence really that this is a detection bias. So uh, I'll go back to the residential side. Is there uh, something besides getting uh, bottled water, but you're still using, uh, you're taking a shower, it's not bottled water. Is there, is there something that can be done at the point of source or at the house that is reducing this or filtering it? Because I understand that it isn't just at the house because now I have hot water and it's stagnant throughout my house, but now I have a point of use. So I, I understand that it'd be futile to probably complete this task, but is there something that I could do to reduce this um, just on a residential um, use? Um, you know, part of it may be uh, accepting the risk or calculating the risk of scalding and crank up your water heater as high as you can get it. Or maybe do that once a month. Turn up the water heater, flush all your hot water lines, and with as hot a water as you can for 20 to 30 minutes. You know, it's a great waste of water. It's a great waste of energy. And it's probably one of the few things you can actually do. But um, that's another thing that has contributed to the increase in cases and the increase in risk factors is water conservation efforts. Uh, the uh, energy bill of 1992 implemented a number of requirements for uh, low flow toilets, low flow fixtures and sinks and faucets, low flow shower heads that over time have become integrated into new homes, uh, renovations. Uh, you know, you, you can't find a shower head that produces more than I think one, one gallon, 1 1.5 gallons per minute. So uh, this has overall reduced the water usage in homes by over half, which means we have still have the same size water lines, but we're moving water through at half the rate, which means the water uh, is twice as old. And so that's another contributing factor is, is the energy conservation efforts to, uh, to reduce the temperatures in the water heaters and the water conservation efforts. All these things tend to increase the risk for bacterial disease. I'm just a full um, of good news, aren't I? You, yeah, you are. This is a crazy, up, upbeat topic. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Gary Klein. Do you know Gary Klein, David? Uh, Gary Klein is uh, one of the most industry experts on on, in, on plumbing, especially residential and a variety of stuff. And he uh, insists that all of our plumbing for existing and new homes is just way too large and that plumbers are just afraid to go to a smaller diameter uh, because they're afraid they're going to mm -hmm. have a pressure drop. But he's he, he has proven that you can build a house with, you know, a half inch is one of your largest pipes and going down to uh, three eighths and even smaller to get good pressure and have less water that's stagnant in your house. And actually it, it, it does the conservation concept you're talking about that we're you know, not using as much water because we don't let it sit in our uh, pipes as long as well as making shorter runs. He's got a, a calculation yeah, about how long should go. Yeah, right, how, how much runs do you have? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, running, keeping the pipes as short as you can and not doing stupid things. Uh, and instead putting dead legs Sometimes when people see, uh, especially in, in, in commercial or healthcare construction, they'll say, oh, well, we might want to spigot over here. We might want to sink over here. Or we might want to, uh, you know, uh, make a little kitchen out of here. So let's run the pipes here while we're at it. And they create a 20, 30 foot dead leg. 
that yeah. basically sits there and festers until it becomes a, a problem. So yeah, it's, uh, it definitely uh, on the right track there. So, so let's say this actually happens and you have a, a Legionella amplification and outbreak in a space. So what happens then? What, what does, uh, you know, what, what is the accepted or what are the accepted options, procedures to actually address this problem? And what, what would a facility do or a uh, home if it had the same problem? Sometimes you end up going, yeah, well, a home is, they're not going to, the health department isn't going to yeah, do anything. They're not gonna. Uh, the home, uh, you know, they, they're not interested in individual pieces of uh, disease. So I have actually done investigations and found, you know, where homeowners have carried out that investigation, found that their home was a source. The unfortunate thing is that when that happens, you often find that the rest of the neighborhood is also affected. So there was an example in a, in a uh, Jacksonville neighborhood where, um, uh, you know, a, a builder went forward with some testing and, and found uh, you know, that one of their, you know, uh, one of the people who bought a home there in a, in a new community was infected with Legionnaire's disease. And we tested his house and it was infected with Legionnaire's disease. And we tested the other, uh, the, the model homes in the neighborhood and they were all infected with Legionnaire, Legionnaire's. Every model home was eaten up with Legionella. At every backflow preventer in the municipal water supply was full of Legionella. And then when we brought that to the municipal water supply, they said, yeah, right, right, right. We'll go do some testing. They tested 22 space, 22 locations throughout the neighborhood. 20 were positive for Legionella. So this was one of those facilities, one of those communities where they planned on building 500 homes. The housing crisis hit, they built 50. So now they have a, a, a water service that is 10 times bigger than it needed to be. Got it. 10 times slower, less turnover, not absolutely no chlorine making it to any of the homes. So there was a, a, a remedy for that. Um, but, you know, if, if an outbreak happens, it'll be because the health department catches on that there's been two reported cases for people, for two or more people. That's, that constitutes an outbreak, two or more people who visited the same place within six months to a year, depending on what kind of facility. And they will declare that an outbreak. And then you're on the roller coaster ride from hell. Uh, depending on the ex experience and expertise and the requirements of the health department, which change from state to state and county to county, uh, you're going to be uh, doing a bunch of testing. They will probably direct you under their public health uh, laws to implement testing, implement hyperchlorination, uh, treating the water systems with high levels of chlorine, um, then testing again. And uh, if you finally get back to a zero detectable level, um, you will need to be uh, maintaining that for at least a year before they uh, stop requiring you to submit samples in order to maintain your certificate of occupancy. But they rarely shut you down. And that becomes the conundrum. They won't tell you you can't accept guests, but they'll tell you you have to notify your guests and your building occupants that you may have a deadly pathogen in your wall here. You know, imagine what the attorneys think about this. Here, sign here, you're checking into the hotel or sign here, you're coming into the gym. By the way, we may have a deadly pathogen here, thought you'd want to know. So do you keep operating? Do you keep inviting in guests? Yeah, are you a health risk? Are you not a health risk? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a mess. So after hyperchlorination, right, you, you do subsequent testing. Um, is, is there a time frame where you, you wait to do the testing or you should wait? You know, I mean, do you take do, do you go in and shock the system and test right away? You know, or do you go in and shock the system and come back and test a Some week later do. or a month later? Or well, what's, what's, yeah. what's good practice? Well, it depends on what you want to find. Um, so if you, if you don't want to find anything, you take, take the test immediately. Well, if you stop testing like, for COVID-19, uh, there's going to be fewer cases too. I mean, it, there's no question about it. Yeah, Outbreak to... goes away. Outbreak goes away. It's funny how that works. Um, it's disappeared. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. M magically. Um, well, what you find is it's similar to if you were to take a, a spore trap sample in a containment area after remediation of mold while the air scrubbers are still running. If you find anything, you've really messed up. Um, so 
if you've disinfected a water system and you collect the samples immediately after, any Legionella that are still there, um, I, I use the term, you've hurt their feelings, but you haven't killed them. Uh, what happens is the, the cell membranes are, are, are damaged, but they're not dead. And so you may not see detectable Legionella for a week or so. Um, I, d I withhold collecting samples for five to seven days after a treatment uh, in order to be able to see uh, either remaining bacteria or a rebound, which can often happen. And, uh, you know, some people assume, well, if I told people to go clean it, uh, it must be clean, right? Um, not the case. Sometimes you just poke the bear. And what they'll do is uh, they'll, they'll basically disrupt the biofilms, the material becomes uh, planktonic and floats through the system. And you go from 30 to 300 to 3,000 CU per mil. So, you know, sloppy or ineffective remediations can actually increase the risk. So you usually just want to wait a week or so uh, after the treatment before you collect samples. But the, 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 top, the tough thing is it takes two weeks back from the laboratory. It's not a fast turnaround. It's a slow growing organism. Hmm. Well, and you mentioned a lot of, you know, a good portion, if not, you know, I dare say all uh, municipality uh, water systems are already <laughs> contaminated with Legionella. So how do you even get to like, what's, what's considered a safe level? You know, it, because it seems like you're always going to have a Legionella background level, right? Or often. It wouldn't be uncommon to have some background level in the enough. water. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's what we see. Now we, st I still see an issue with um, public health authorities and many consultants. Um, they will do Legionella testing in the, in the potable water system of a building, but not bother to test the water coming in. It's like doing a mold sample, uh, a spore trap sample indoors, but not doing a concomitant outdoor sample. So you don't know if you're getting anything or not. And so many people will just interpret it, uh, uh, assume that any Legionella that they detect in the facility is coming, is, is inherent because of the facility. And, if they, and they're blind to the fact that they may be getting significant concentrations coming in from the municipal water supply. So we always test the incoming water, sometimes multiple times during the sampling event, because it's kind of like throwing a Dixie cup in the middle of the Mississippi River. And if you reel it back in and you don't find any fish in it, would you say there's no fish there? It's a very small sample. You Southern and guys so, have the greatest analogies, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's always... <laughs> I just had to throw that At least that it doesn't have anything to do with my pappy's mule. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> I want to uh, I want to shift slightly and lead into what we're going to do next week uh, with you, David. So next week is about schools and back to schools. But the one underlying thing we're not going to talk about next week, so I want to try and get it in now, is that you know all these schools they have been sitting vacant, like one more vacant than they ever been. Usually they had some small staff or they had things happening at the school, something where they had some type of water usage. Uh, or something that made the building a little active. Now they are, they've been dead in the water for months. Um, and even before the kids come back, a bunch of teachers are going to be walking into these buildings and they're going to be the first exposure. So uh, can you kind of elaborate on the risk that these buildings have for, especially these teachers that are coming back to be the first people to sometimes turn on a water system that's been sitting stagnant for maybe two months? Yeah, yeah, uh, certainly a, a great concern, both uh, uh, K through 12 schools, whether they're private or public, uh, universities uh, have really gone through a period of stagnation they've, they've never experienced before. Um, their, their resources are also being uh, tasked to, to handle you know, disinfectants and hand, hand washing stations and everything else. And the teachers, the, uh, especially the elderly teachers, the um, administrators, the custodians, they're the ones who, in these instances, are the ones who actually contract the disease. Somewhat similar to COVID-19, children seem to be remarkably, uh, remarkably uh, resilient, robust, and, and unlikely to contract Legionnaire's disease. Uh, I can probably count on one hand the number of childhood cases I've ever seen recorded in the literature uh, or seen in any uh, cases I've dealt with. So maybe there's a common thing that we should be looking at uh, as to you know, why are children uh, less susceptible, not zero, 
but less susceptible to COVID and also much less susceptible to Legionnaires. Um, but you also need to think about the, the surrounding cooling towers when they're present at schools are a huge risk to not only the people in the school, but the entire surrounding community. They are an aerosol dispersion device, and when they become contaminated, can spread that material throughout an entire you know, region, sometimes well over a mile in each uh, in diameter. So um, definitely something that needs to be raised in the consciousness of school uh, facilities. I do not know where they're gonna get the money. I do not know where they're gonna get the resources necessary to clean and disinfect these systems that should have been cleaned already, that were probably dirty to begin with, and may be, you know, literally a, a, a minefield that they're walking back into. Thank it's goodness, though, I will say Legionnaires is not contagious from person to person. It's not transmitted from person to person. I was just asked that question. Let's clarify that, is that it's no not community. contagious like COVID says, right? Yeah, no is your mask, transfer. is your is a mask a somewhat um, preventable concept that's happening with these aerosolized particles? So if I had a, you know, where many people are all living with a mask, is at least is that a reduction of exposure? Probably by not more than 5 or 10% at the most. Um, the, the aerosols that you're worried about that contain the Legionella bacteria, they need to actually deposit well into the lungs. So you're talking about the fine droplet nuclei, the, the one five micron sized particles. Mask is not even going to touch that. So uh, unfortunately, I don't see that we're going to see have much uh, protection there. Okay. <clears throat> This is a, uh, a, a I'm, I'm now gonna look at water as the most evil thing in my house. Um, in the, I thought your I, air was the worst. <laughs> no, not anymore. Water is now actually superseded that. So um, I can flush my house easier than I can, you know, flush my hot water tank and water system. So uh, yeah, I do keep my hot water tank uh, uh, higher than average. So I have, I have no kids in my house anymore. So we understand. He Germany likes a good skull. Many years. Yeah, I well, the Germans do too. Uh, I lived in Germany for many years when I was in the service, and they run their water hot, 150, 165 degrees, because they don't run chlorine in their water. You know, they're really into the purity laws, especially with their beer. Um, but that's the, uh, you know, how they handle their, but they still have Legionnaires issues. They, they, they really do. Um, this is not, but Legionnaires traditionally is a first world problem. It's a problem of having indoor plumbing. It's a problem of having hot water. It's a problem of having air conditioning systems. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's one in which we uh, bring upon ourselves. So let's go, I've asked you this many times whenever you're on. So if I, if I was a building owner or school superintendent or somebody, what type of person would I want to come out and assess my water system? I mean, that, that's not just, um, I think, any, any average person to do that. And uh, luckily, that's not something that people have been grabbing onto. Like, oh, yeah, I can test your water for you because what they're doing. Oh, is give it, just give it a minute. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, the first one I'll tell you, the first one I'll tell you not to use is the water treatment supplier for your treatment systems you have. Um, Many of them may be very well competent and qualified to do it. But there's an inherent conflict of interest in which you're asking somebody, hey, by the way, go test your own work and uh, test your own, you know, grade your own homework and come back and tell me if you've created a problem that uh, I didn't know about. That doesn't work out so well. Um, AIHA, the American Industrial Hygiene Association, is working to develop okay, a body of knowledge for competent professionals and competent technicians. And those uh, efforts are moving forward uh, very uh, speedily and in great direction and in cooperation with the National Environmental Health Association, NEHA. And we're trying to develop the core foundations and competencies that individuals would uh, need to meet in order to be a competent professional who is uh, assessing building water systems for Legionella, uh, for those who are responding to outbreaks, and for technicians who would be doing the daily testing, measurements, monitoring, and implementing water management strategies. So right now, there's no credential, there's no license, there's no uh, 
car carrying folks, you can call up and be sure that they are who they think they are, uh, who they claim to be. And uh, it is very much buyer beware. But um, many industrial hygienists know what they're doing. Some don't. Um, many engineers know what they're doing. Many don't. Uh, many microbiologists, great in the lab, don't take them to the field. So it just really depends upon the individual, their expertise and experience and background and um, ask for references. The other one that I usually try to clarify is, um, is there something about the lab? It's like if I talk to somebody to try and find out how knowledgeable they were, I usually ask them, oh, and, and what lab are you sending your results to? Is there something that would be a good question to qualify that? But yeah, this person sounds credible and their lab also sounds credible. I now feel more confident about them. So what, what would you say about a lab that you say, yeah, that, that well, had credentials for this? Yeah, the, the labs are important. Uh, not every lab is the same. Uh, there is a, a certification, uh, certification, credentialing program, registration, I forget what it's called, ELITE, E-L-I-T-E. -E. It was initially established by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to help establish base level of competency for laboratories that do Legionella analysis. That is, I think, underway or in the process of that, that, that credentialing program is being shifted over to Wisconsin Occupational Health Labs to run. CDC is trying to get out of the business of certifying laboratories to do this. Um, it is, it's the bar they have to clear. It's not a very high bar. It's a pretty low bar for most laboratories to do it. So you at least want to make sure that the lab uh, is elite certified. And that can be uh, found by looking by just simply Googling CDC elite lab list. And it'll take you to the CDC website and they have a list of, of uh, laboratories in each state that have been met this credential. Um, but, and, and if you don't use an elite lab and you, try to present those test results to the health department as part of your investigation. Uh, I have seen them more than once since they said, oh, that's nice. Go hire an elite and go back with, you know, go redo it all. And that could be tens of thousands of dollars worth of lab work. So um, it, is a, it is a minimum criteria. You really want to look at laboratories that have been doing this for 10, 20, 30 years. And there aren't many that have been doing it that long. So. Uh, the, the length of time they've been doing the analysis uh, is really, a, to me, the differentiator. And to confirm, the Home Depot water test does not do a Legionella um, test. It's not confirming if I have Legionella. No. Okay. Wouldn't find it if it was staring you in the face. Or any other box store's uh, water test. That's right, yes. Any, <laughs> any other hardware store that you might find a water test uh, by somebody that says that, you know, I, I, they do test something, but they do not test Legionella. No, no. You're gonna pay, you're gonna pay at least a hundred dollars per sample for most Legionella tests. It's not a, a simple one plate streak it and watch it grow for forty eight hours. It's much more complicated, unfortunately. There's also a transport issue, right? I mean, because the you're you're living organism, so it's got to get there. It's got to be uh, held at a temperature. I mean. It's, it's, it's more than just, uh, well, actually, or, or is it, or is it's, it? It's pretty it, robust. It, is it? You know, think about it. it you're talking, yeah. Um, you do want to have priority overnight. You want to get it there. You don't want it sitting on a shipping dock or a loading dock over the weekend. Um, cause it can affect the results, but it's a pretty robust organism. If it was fragile, it, it'd be easy to get rid of. But yeah. I, and it I probably doesn't go over 160 degrees over. in your FedEx truck. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. That's a good point. Well, they should not be taking samples on no. Friday. That, that's a key indicator. Well, you know. that's with any, any cultural samples. You shouldn't be taking samples on Friday unless you actually drive it to a lab and, and drop it there right. and they actually right. treat it. Uh, that that, that yeah. brings up a whole – we, we need to have a show on this. this, by the way. Yeah, Friday sampling. It's a good, ex, good excuse to not work on Fridays. The Friday um, sampler. <laughs> <laughs> or that you're, or the person coming to your house is not, not you, you need to fire them immediately. If they're like, oh yeah, I'll be on there on Friday to take samples. That's, you know, this is not the person you want to hire. Yeah. Uh, but I, I actually run into this where we collected samples. Uh, they made it to the lab, but it sat on somebody's, somebody else's desk and they were gone for a week and they didn't get, realize that they had them. So we ended up going back and resampling and we had them go ahead and run the initial results. There was no difference. 
So, really? you know, we didn't entirely rely upon that. Uh, but the, the results that we saw, there was no significant difference in the values. They were within the normal range of variability. So it's a pretty robust organism. I, I've gone into hot tubs, or not gone into them, come to test hot tubs at, at hotels. And literally five minutes after they have cleaned the hot tub, done, you know, they, they, they were trying to clean it and disinfect it. There was Legionella in plenty enough concentrations to detect it five minutes after they had done their disinfection protocols. Uh, it was literally in slime balls on the deck. It, you know, it's, it's, if it's there, you'll find it. I will not go into a hotel hot tub. I immediately <laughs> toss the bedspread to the corner of the room. These are, these are just certain practices that I have when I travel. It's, you don't, you know, don't you want have to be in human soup? And you, yeah, you know, okay. I know, and I and I I brought a black light with me once on, to a conference at, at a, you know, and I was at a hotel, and I've never packed that again. <laughs> 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 That's the reaction. Yeah, try it sometime. Just say no. Just say no. <laughs> okay. on your so way out. Let, let, let's shift it's that this. Time. It's that it time. is that time. So it's that time where I can ask. You know, what are your um, final uh, comments about um, l- let's go with more of a prediction because I, I like to do something that we can look back on and be like okay we're opening we opened up kind of now we're back to closing down schools are going to open up do you think Legionella will actually hit the uh, the news waves or the airwaves or will actually be aware of what's happening COVID dominates the news on everything we don't even know what's going on in any part of the world except what, what what's going on with COVID in the news. So do you think it actually will become a significant enough issue that we'll even be aware of it uh, in the next six months? How about that, David? That's going to depend on whether or not health agencies do their job. Uh, the only way we know about outbreaks is because of the surveillance system and the, and the laws required in reporting of Legionnaire's disease uh, cases. So um, I have every bit of uh, unfortunate confidence that Legionnaire's disease will become a major public health threat as we reopen. Whether or not it's recognized, spotted, you know, it becomes apparent in the news will depend on many factors. Uh, so I think it's probably a 50-50 chance that people in facilities will recognize it because they're so hyper-focused on uh, COVID-19 and there may be a conflation of these uh, patients. So was that waffly enough of a, an answer? Well, yeah, 50, 50. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's <laughs> you, you got a pretty, you got a pretty good shot of you know, being like a Karnak with that. That's not bad. All right. Well, you, you at least gave us, uh, I, I agree. Well, with you. It, will, it will be an issue whether or not it becomes a public awareness issue will be the, the real challenge for what actually happens. So well, yeah. think about this the country, this world went probably 40 years before we even knew this organism existed. Um, There were retrospective studies on uh, clinical samples from the 50s in which they had pneumonia outbreaks of unknown origin. They went back once they figured out how to test for Legionella, found that that outbreak was due to Legionnaire's disease and Legionella. So we went decades in the time period when we started having air conditioning systems and cooling towers, started having uh, hot water systems within homes and businesses and didn't know it existed. So we could easily lose that vision, that ability to see the problem if we simply don't look for it. Well, I don't think we even mentioned how it got its name. Do you want to briefly explain that? Is that, you know? Oh, sure. As a veteran, I feel it's, uh, it's important to recognize uh, how we treat our veterans. Um, and uh, the, the most uh, uh, notable thing we often have about them is the uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars uh, Convention in 1976 at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel in Philadelphia, in which there was an outbreak of disease. Uh, I think around 300 or so uh, were diagnosed with this pneumonia. Many died. Uh, I think over 40 something died. And it led to the investigation by the CDC to actually figure out this was the source. Now, ironically, they looked back uh, two years prior 
and there had been an outbreak of uh, the same disease at the same hotel, same time period, that was never truly diagnosed. They didn't get, they didn't get the national attention. It didn't get the uh, diagnosis and, and the uh, outbreak response. And it really tells you how important it is to have a good name because if they, if the CDC had done their job two years prior, if they had investigated and found the source of this, it not only would have saved the lives of, of dozens of uh, war veterans, but we would also be talking about Oddfellows disease instead of Legionnaires disease, because it was the Order of Oddfellows Convention that had suffered this, this, this outbreak prior to this. So a bit of odds history. I think it was American Legion, uh, American Legion though, not Veteran Foreign Wars. Yes. Yes, correct. That's correct. Hence the name Legion. But, I'm, just, I'm just picking on you, David. <laughs> it's, it, it's so rare. It's so rare that I could ever find a point that I know something you don't know or, or catch you doing, you know, not being completely on top of something. So it's, it's never happened. Be- Actually, it's never happened before. So I had to point it out. I don't know. You may not be invited back. David. Appreciate that it. Was total yeah. Flaw. <laughs> yeah it's like, no. you know, well, I mean, come on, you got a PhD, you're CIH, you know, and you're a damn nice man to, to boot. So I guess, so I guess, you know, we're, we're going toward that whole wrap up time. So let me, uh, let's uh, just look ahead here. The uh, July issue of Healthy Indoors magazine, uh, the online digital edition will be out soon. Our cover story is on uh, going back to school. Uh, that'll be out in a few days. So definitely uh, open, open your eyes and uh, keep, keep your eyes uh, looking uh, for your emails. If you're not currently a subscriber, you can go to healthyindoors.com uh, on the far right on that top menu that Joe's shown. You don't have to hit the button, but you can subscribe there. It's free. It's easy. And we don't sell your, uh, your information uh, to anybody else. So it's uh, definitely something that you should uh, partake in because it's free information. It's always available. Also, at healthyindoors.com, you can access all the back episodes of the Healthy Indoors show and the Healthy Indoors podcast, along with a bunch of other stuff. Great resources, uh, backlogs of tons of information. Great, great place to go. Um, I spend a lot of time there, but then again, I'm biased. Um, Joe, Joe Medosh is with Hayward Score. Tell us about Hayward Score and why we need to know about it. So uh, we are a free resource that allows you to uh, determine if your home is uh, potentially impacting your house or actually make, giving you a safe haven, a place that you really enjoy being in. So you can go online. Have, we have some phenomenal resources. Um, we do not have anything about Legionella, but that doesn't mean that we won't see that fairly soon. But um, a lot of other great resources about VOCs or uh, contaminants and a variety of stuff that you do actually have in your residential home that you could actually be more aware of and learn how to take care of yourself. And you could take the score and uh, have uh, individualized uh, recommendations as to what you can do from yourself or how to actually hire a contractor to fix your crawl space. Uh, great advice that's universal to anybody who lives in a, uh, some type of, uh, if you're an occupant period, renter or a uh, homeowner. Thanks. And where, where do you get that again? That is at uh, haywardscore.com. And it is free. And it is free. Uh, there's so much free here. We're such givers. Free magazine, free free scores, free you know, free information, um, and and really free advice. Worth, it's worth what you paid for it, right? Yeah. Well, I'd like to I'd like to think that we're worth a lot more than, than what you're pay, what you paid for, you know. So, with that, I'd really like to uh, once again thank Dr. David Krause, um, our all time champion now, because you've clearly uh, surpassed any other uh, guests on our show in the last four months. Um, I, I want the Alec Baldwin uh, dim, uh, smoking jacket. You know, we'll work on it. We'll work on that for you for the next time. But um, again, David, uh, David is just a uh, great resource and uh, uh, always welcome here. You can you can be on the show anytime. So David Krause, founder of uh, HC3 in Tallahassee, Florida. He's uh, he, he's he's a man to seek out if you have some questions. So with that, um, I'd like to you, uh, go to the final wrap up here. Um, you know, again, healthy indoors. Um, the magazine will be out in a couple of days. We'll uh, always be here bringing you information on a weekly basis. The Healthy Indoors show is every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, one hour thing. Uh, generally, Joe Medosh is uh, sitting in the co-pilot seat there. Um, we'll uh, again have uh, a great 
array of information for you coming up. Uh, check our website, healthyindoors.com for the upcoming schedule. We've got a lot of a lot of good things in the horizon. Corbett Lunsford will be back to join us. The uh, st- uh, the uh, host of the online PBS show, Home Diagnosis, will be back in a couple of weeks. And a lot of other good things on tap. So uh, with that, um, for the Healthy Indoors show and Healthy Indoors magazine, I'm Bob Krell. We'll see you guys next week uh, here on healthyindoors.com.